Hello everyone and welcome to Irene the Educator. On other platforms, I've been telling everyone about the important role of vitamin D. I came across this excellent video about vitamin D and the correlation of COVID-19 and vitamin D. It is a video that has Kyle Audrey and he is interviewing or asking questions from Dr. Roger Sehut. One of the reasons I love this video is because it explains the correlation. It explains about what vitamin D is. And it also shows the correlation of vitamin D and COVID-19. It also has um, how you can get vitamin D in your system and who is mostly affected by vitamin D. So what I wanted to do before I get into the disclaimer, provide that short preview of what to expect from this video. Thank you. Disclaimer, my videos are for entertainment and educational purposes only. Fair Use Act Disclaimer, Copyright Disclaimer, under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. No copyright is intended. All rights reserved. Although this video is less than 11 minutes, it is packed with information that you will find useful in your everyday life and it will help you. I am telling you, I was so excited to find this video and share it with you. So look for the full link to the video in the description. So let's sit back, relax and learn. Dr. Schwell, you've advocated for vitamin D as a potential way to prevent COVID-19 infections, to prevent severe COVID-19 infections. Uh, you've talked about this for a few months now. And over the past several months, uh, the evidence continues to grow. There's more and more publications in peer-reviewed medical journals about the possible connection between vitamin D and COVID-19. Uh, so you've put together a presentation for us, uh, tell us about what uh, what your presentation is all about. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So we've been talking about vitamin D as a potential therapeutic agent for COVID-19 since March. And since that time, a lot of other people have become involved in looking at that agent as well. A number of research studies have been done. And the purpose of this is to sort of look at the evolution and the thinking of the use of vitamin D in COVID-19. So what we do is we look back even before COVID-19 and what was the evidence for vitamin D in acute chest infections, for instance, influenza, and what was the data there? And then we look at the epidemiological evidence for vitamin D as a therapeutic agent in COVID-19, and then finally moving along to actual cases, hospitalizations, and then we build up with that hierarchy of evidence with uh, vitamin D and COVID-19 to randomize placebo-controlled trials, which of course are the gold standard for therapeutics. Okay, so let's talk about vitamin D. The first thing you've got to understand is that vitamin D is not just a vitamin. Vitamin D is actually a hormone. And if you notice here by the structure, you'll see that it is a steroid hormone, which means it can go into the nucleus. It can go through membranes and make effective changes. And specifically, the vitamin D receptor is a member of this nuclear receptor steroid hormone superfamily. And so as you can see here, we have vitamin D going through the membrane and affecting a binding to the receptor. And then it actually goes into the nucleus where it can affect transcriptional change. This is really important. So this is not just some vitamin that you need to supplement with. This is actually a hormone that changes the way your cells in the body actually behave. Is this idea unique to vitamin D or um, does this happen with other vitamins? And in addition to that, what, what are some of the main differences between a vitamin and a hormone? Good question. So, you know, a, a vitamin is actually a shortened version of a vital amine. Vital meaning you need it to live and an amine 
is a type of chemical compound. You know, uh, vitamin D is not even an amine. Of course, it's vital, but it's not as if you need a certain amount of this substance to just keep the body going and doing what it needs to do. No, I mean, vitamin D is so much more complex than that. We used to think that vitamin D was just involved in calcium regulation, and that is certainly true. There's no question about that. But vitamin D is so much more than that. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, which means it can pass through membranes uh, without any problem. Uh, it doesn't need to be regulated. It can bind with the receptor and go directly into the cellular uh, portion, the nucleus, in fact, and actually uh, cause or prevent transcription of RNA. And we've seen that there are vitamin D receptors in numerous cell types, including uh, the, the cell types of the immune system. So in that sense, it, it is a hormone, uh, but it, in another sense, you can only produce enough of this if you have enough sunlight or if you're taking this um, in, in, in a dietary supplement form. You can't make this without sunlight or getting a dietary form. So in that sense, it is vital that you have it, and in the loose sense, it is a vitamin. So to get to your second question about hormones and, and vitamins, Hormones are something that the body uses to signal and to make effect changes throughout the body. For instance, insulin is a hormone. Uh, cortisol is a hormone. Uh, these things circulate through the body and they have different effects on different target tissues. Vitamins are more along the lines of something that you need as a cofactor or something else to get something to work. And so in that sense, vitamin D is, is certainly a vitamin because your body needs it in order to live. But in another sense, it's so much more than just the vitamin. So how do you get this vitamin D? Now, I know this looks a little complicated, but bear with me. The key that you need to understand is that it's the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D that's the active form. And it says here that it does come from the kidneys. But in fact, we now know that the rate limiting step that puts that one hydroxyl group on is not just in the kidneys, it's also in the immune cells. And it can actually put that on and have effective change in your immune cells themselves. So let's talk a little bit about how this happens. So there's basically two ways you can get vitamin D into your diet. You can either eat it through a supplementation, swallow it, you can take pills. It's also found in fish oil, certain types of mushrooms, egg yolks, and also red meat. Or the majority of the people get vitamin D into their system from the sun. Why is that? Because ultraviolet B radiation penetrates down deep into the dermis where this cholesterol derivative is converted into pre-vitamin D3 and then finally into vitamin D. Now that vitamin D3, after it's produced by the sun, goes to the liver and the 25-hydroxyl gets put onto it. This species here, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, is what we actually measure in the blood. Whether you get it from diet or whether you get it from the sun, there's two ways of getting it, but this is how we can measure it. And that's how you're gonna see it measured and reported in the rest of this presentation is 25-hydroxy vitamin D. This is kind of like the storage product in your body. It's fat soluble, it is stored in the fat. Then when it's needed, it can either go to the immune system where it's converted into 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form, or it can go to the kidney and it can be converted there to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Now, the one in the kidney is usually used for metabolism of calcium and phosphorus and things of that nature, but there's a whole other area. In fact, they found many vitamin D receptors in the leukocytes or the white blood cells, your immune cells in the body. Now, the other thing you ought to know is that this 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form, can be inactivated when they put a hydroxyl group, they being the 24 hydroxylase enzyme, can inactivate it by hydroxylating the 24 position. Can also do it here with 25 hydroxy from the kidney as well. So this is the inactive form. There is some evidence, and if you want more information about this, look at COVID-19 update 83 in our MedCram series, and you'll see that high fructose corn syrup actually can accelerate this inactivation of both the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and also the 25 hydroxy vitamin D to the inactive form. So that's not to say that other sugars with fructose couldn't do that, but that's what the study showed that we presented in update 83. So you may be supplementing, you may be out in the sun, but if you have a diet that's high in high fructose corn syrup, 
and I'm not talking about fructose from fruits and vegetables, but actually high fructose corn syrup, that is something that can cause problems and you may not get enough 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. We'll put a link to that video, number 83. Okay, so you may ask, well, what's the problem? I mean, if we just need to go out in the sun and get plenty of vitamin D, why is this an issue? Well, the issue is, is that if you were to look at recent studies that look at how often we here in the United States and in fact around the world spend outdoors, it's actually pretty small. 7.6% of the day we spend outdoors. The problem is in the winter time, the sun gets up late and goes down early. And also it's not as high in the sky as it should be to get that direct radiation of ultraviolet B. And so it's coming in at an angle, you don't get very good exposure. And in fact, for those people who are living above the 35th parallel or living below the 35th parallel in the Southern hemisphere, this can be a very significant issue. The 35th parallel, for those who don't know, sort of runs through the middle of the United States. Now, some have suggested that this may be the reason why we see an increase in viral infections in the winter time, whether it's in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Winter time is when you're having less sun exposure. But could this also be explained? Could the increase in viral infections also be explained by just people spending more time indoors, uh, in, in close confinement, um, you know, windows closed, uh, potential for, for spread that way, among other potential confounding variables? Yeah, it certainly is possible. Um, one of the things that goes against that, though, Kyle, is that, for instance, uh, in the United States in the wintertime, uh, in California, for instance, uh, Southern California, it rarely gets uh, cold enough that you have to be indoors. Uh, but we still see an increase and a spike in influenza during that time. What is uh, certain, though, in, in, in California, and uh, this is where the 35th parallel sort of runs right through Southern California, is studies have shown that if you live above the 35th parallel, you can't really get enough vitamin D just by sun exposure in the wintertime. So while it is possible that there could be confounders, we're seeing the sunlight exposure correlating with uh, the increase in uh, infectious diseases. I, I would note, if you look at this graphic from the CDC in terms of statistics, we see that in just the very months where we have vitamin D deficiency is where we have spikes and increases in influenza. Now, wasn't that interesting? Did I not tell you that that video was going to really give you a lot of information? Even though you didn't see the full video, I really do encourage you to go to the description area and follow the link for the full video because I only share it with you like less than 11 minutes of it, but it is packed with information. I'm sure you learned something about vitamin D. And also make sure you visit the CDC for the latest and up-to-date information in regards to what's going on with COVID and all that. And remember to like, share, and subscribe, and also comment. Thank you. By subscribing, you'll get notification for the next video.